Welcome back into the mental game. I'm your host, Brandon Seho. And if you're watching on YouTube, yes, you can see I still have this mustache. It is the Who Day stash for my Cincinnati Bengals, who are undefeated since I started growing the mustache. So it'll stay, hopefully, all the way to the Super Bowl, even though I know it looks bad. Back to the mental game. This week's episode is with NFL sideline reporter from Amazon Prime's Thursday Night Football. Kaylee Hartung, and this is an amazing conversation. Kaylee opens up about her journalism career, the ups and downs, what's it been like for her to live out her dream on the NFL sidelines, and we also talk about the adversity she's had to overcome after losing her father at a young age. All of that and much, much more here in the latest episode of The Mental Game. But before we get started, let's kick things off with this week's Mental Health Tip of the Week, powered by 1 in 5, and it is all about positive self-talk. If no one has told you today, I am proud of you. You deserve to hear those words every day, and an easy way to do so is through positive affirmation. Phrases like, I deserve love, I am making a positive impact, I am proud of myself, and so many more have been proven to improve self-esteem, stress management, and overall well-being. We can often be our own biggest critics when we should be our own biggest supporters. Writing yourself encouraging notes and speaking kindly in your head are ways to love ourselves better. And if you or someone you know needs help finding a therapist or mental health resources, this QR code will be in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen this entire episode, and it'll take you directly to One in Five's homepage, where their mission is to prevent suicide by stopping the stigma and starting the conversation. Now it is time for an impactful conversation with NFL sideline reporter Kaylee Hartung in our latest episode on The Mental Game. Welcome back into the mental game. I am joined now by Kaylee Hartung, sideline reporter for Amazon Prime. Thursday Night Football, it is great to meet you. Thank you so much for doing this. It's so nice to meet you. Love the Baton Rouge connection. Yes. And glad that uh, we're both in Cincinnati for a Thursday Night Football game on Amazon Prime Video. It's still, uh, it's like still a pinch me sort of thing, you know, to right. say I'm a part of it. Well, so. we have the connection from Baton Rouge. You grew up in Baton Rouge, worked at SEC Network. I worked at the ABC station covering LSU. So we crossed paths a little bit. And now it's cool to connect on this project, which I was telling you about. And the first thing I ask everyone is what does mental health mean to you? And a lot of people have different answers, whether events that happen through their life or what they're learning now. Um, so I'll ask you the same thing. What does mental health mean to you? It's I've grown to learn more about what it means mm -hmm. to give yourself time and to put emphasis on taking care of your own mental health. I think in large part because I was a kid who experienced, I think, some of the worst trauma that you can at a, at a young age, losing mm -hmm. my father when I was 10 and then my best friend when I was 13, both in, in tragic, really unexpected accidents. Um, so for me, growing up, I was so, I identified so closely with those traumas, right? right? Like working my way through them, growing up quickly made me the person that I am today. Mm -hmm. But it was a very long time before I kind of wrapped my mind around the attention we all need to pay to right. the toll that that can take. Even if you think it's made you stronger, you know, even if you think it's made you who you are, um, life takes a toll and everybody's right. got their shit. Uh, yeah. so, you know, you have to learn what's best for you. I don't think there's a one size fits all formula, mm -hmm. um, for anybody, of course, but, um, you know, in, in a funny way, I think for me, it was like once work started taking like a physical toll on me that was yeah. just exhausting in a way. And then I had to start processing once I crossed from sports into the news side, mm -hmm. um, the trauma that I was having to witness in right. other people's lives yeah. that it helped me reflect more on what that men in my own life. Yeah, I had the local news in me before I switched to sports. Sports is what I always wanted to do, but in this business, as you know, it takes a while to break in, get certain jobs. So I had to work on the news side first, then got into sports supporting. Uh, you mentioned, though, just having to deal with something very traumatic at a young age. Your dad passed away. He was a pilot and passed away on a flight. And you're 10 years old. You don't even 
know what like really who you are about mental health about anything really you're just a fun kid at that point how do you how how were you able to process that I mean, i'm sure it was just one a shock and two you're still growing up yeah. like it, it's got to be I had to take a big toll on you yeah i mean the worst day of my life as i think is the case for so many people was the most defining day of my life mm -hmm. you know at 10 years old i not only lost my father in a plane crash but i watched the plane crash in front of me me and you know about 30,000 other people at an air show in Lafayette, Louisiana, mm -hmm. which you know the irony of that was that my father was a pilot who flew in air shows literally around the world and it right. just so happened to be the one closest to our home where we actually were. Um, and so I, I was a kid who grew up with a dad who I thought, as I think many kids do, you know that my dad was invincible, that my dad yeah. was like Superman. Um, and he was so incredibly talented at his craft. Um, and I, you know, at, at 10 years old, never had concept of the risk that he was taking every right. time he went up in the air. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you I don't just, really you grasp don't, it at that age. You don't age. think about, yeah. you don't think about that. Um, and I think looking back on that moment, one of the wildest things to realize was that even though I saw the plane crash in front of me, death didn't cross my mind. Mm -hmm. I remember thinking, oh my gosh, how quickly can we get to the hospital? You know, is he going to have to learn how to walk again? Right. You know, how difficult is this going to make his life and our life? But nevertheless, like death, losing him mm -hmm. didn't seem like even a possibility right. in that moment. Um, and I, looking back on, I mean, I remember the look on my mother's face. I remember the feeling, how tightly she grabbed me. And it clearly, when she was an adult, she was um, younger than I am now which is wow. weird to think about, but she knew, right. She knew instantly. And, um, realizing that, uh, lack of recognition that I had in that moment, I think sums it up in a, in a whole lot of ways. Sure. Uh, but for me, I think I just, I, I chose the path of growing up fast mm -hmm. of trying to be the, the best daughter and the best big sister I could and, you know, be the most mature and, and be the best, you know, example that my dad had set for me, um, and make him proud. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen the conversation that Anderson Cooper and Stephen Colbert have had about grief. So both mm -hmm. of them lost their dads when they were 10 years old. Wow. Um, and I remember, oh gosh, where I forget where I was. I remember I was in a hotel room, you know, traveling for work as right. I am right now. And I came across it and this was just maybe two years ago, uh, maybe three years ago before the, just before the pandemic, maybe, um, I came across this conversation that they had about the concept of grief. And it was like, this light went off for me as somebody who never went to therapy. Mm -hmm. Um, don't recommend that. You know, yeah. I mean, I fully, I, I, it um, took me yeah. 12, 13 years to finally go. So, but, um, but it was like, all of a sudden here was this conversation that I was listening to, you know, 20 plus years mm -hmm. after experiencing the worst grief you can. And like, here are all of these questions being asked and words put to questions that I, the thoughts had swirled in my head, but I never knew yeah. how to ask. And, and like the core of it was this concept that I would do anything anything to have one more day with my dad I'd do anything to have him with me for all of these years and to have him with me today but the fact of the matter is like I am who I am today because I lost him mm -hmm. and because of what that trauma forced me to become um so it's like this an, an impossible question yeah you know to ask yourself and, and an impossible scenario to think through um but anyway it's a I YouTube it Colbert and Anderson Cooper on sure. grief. You can find it. And I, I could not recommend it more for anybody who's right. endured it. I definitely will. And, and I, I want to ask about the experience you talked about. Your dad was a star in his own right. And I think just me from an outsider makes it seem like one that made you grow up quick, but also it had to inspire you to do what you're doing now. A hundred percent. Um, a hundred percent. You know, I think that one of the greatest gifts my dad gave me was the, the willingness to dream big. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he was born in Indonesia, grew up in the Netherlands, served in the Dutch military and, uh, flying planes and came to the States with like nothing more than his skill as a pilot and a mechanic with like a dream. Yeah. And he truly lived the American dream in a way that, you know, as a kid, I didn't even, it was just normal, right. you know, it, it didn't seem just exceptional. It, it, it was... just was what he did and how he did it. And so that work ethic and determination, um, and willingness to dream was it just instilled in me mm -hmm. in that way. But the truth is, is that the day he died, 
was the day I decided what I wanted to do with my life. At 10 years old, I decided I wanted to tell other people's stories. And that was because that night we came home and, and you know, the house was filled with people in the way that right. it can be in a time of mourning. And the TV was on CNN, I think, just for noise more than anything else. Nobody was paying attention mm -hmm. to what was on the screen. But then... The room fell silent when here comes what I now know to be like a 30 second anchor voiceover. Right. Uh, um, and the anchor is just saying, you know, today in front of 30,000 people in Lafayette, Louisiana, a pilot crashed. And I'm watching this at 10 years old and like it doesn't make sense to me. Like and then all of a sudden the report's over. There was no mention of the man he was and the life he'd lived and all the things he had accomplished or the family he'd left behind. His death was just treated as an event. Right. And there was no humanity behind it that I could decipher at that age. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand how that was it. Right. The worst moment of my life, uh, the most defining moment of my life just was talked about on television. And I felt no connection to it. Mm -hmm. And I thought in that moment, like, I don't want people to feel this way when their lives are talked about on TV. So that yeah. was really the jumping off point for me to think I want to tell other people's stories and make sure that I do my best so that people don't feel the way that I did. Um, did I, re you know, think in that moment that it would lead me to where I am now? No. Um, but here we are. And I've been asked the question a lot lately, you know, because I was from news to sports, right, to news yeah. to sports. And I've been in the business, I get the ba bouncing right? back and forth, but a lot of but people, a lot of sure people don't, a lot yeah. of people don't. And, um, the truth is, is that at the beginning of the, my career, sports is where my momentum was. And yeah. I, I really enjoyed that growing up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Yep. Um, you know, it's just it's again, not something that's LSU like and Tigers. I mean, instilled I've, in you. I'm from Cincinnati. So like I'm a homer when it comes to the Bengals, the Reds, University of Cincinnati. But like I grew up watching SEC football on Sundays on CBS. And the first time I walked out and you've done it, when you walk out of that LSU locker room, it, it's like a doorway the size of in between us. There's 110,000 people the wind there. Bar. Yeah, and you walk out, and it is like, holy shit, this is the real deal. It's nuts. It's the best. It's the best. But so sports was where my momentum was early in my career to tell stories, and then I got the opportunity to jump to news, and I wasn't emotionally ready to leave sports because I was having so much fun. Right. But because news was always the goal, again, because it was born from that worst day in my life, mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to prove to myself that I could do it. And, and that's what I did for five years. So often I showed up on the worst days of people's lives and I'm really proud of the work that I did there. And, you know, yeah, today, I, I mean, I feel fortunate that I'm not being sent to a hurricane in Florida. Right. You know, I feel very lucky that I'm here covering this football game, but like there is a certain sense of, of course, responsibility, mm -hmm. um, and doing the hard work that comes with covering a major event such sure. as that. But when the opportunity came to come back to sports and people are asking, why, why did you do it? Why would you leave a great job? And it was a great job that I had at ABC news that I loved and enjoyed so much. Um, and I took great pride in, but I'm getting back to covering the best days of people's lives. And I appreciate that privilege, um, and take it just as seriously as I took the previous one. That was, the main point, like for me switching from, I always wanted to do sports. Like I said, got stuck in news at the beginning and you are going to people when they lose somebody they love or their house just burned down mm -hmm. or there's a fire and you know, someone died. Like it is the worst day of their lives. And then you get switched to sports. And like last year, best year of my career, university of Cincinnati goes to the playoff. Bengals are in the super bowl. So much fun. And I was curious because I was like working alongside of you in the SEC when you were there and you were so good at that. Oh, and you. so to hear the backstory now, I was always wondering why you left because I thought sports was number one for you, but it really mm -hmm. was news. That's, yeah. that's what you grew up wanting to do, right? Well, for me, I think the goal has always been to have a broad foundation mm -hmm. to have a long career. Yeah. You know, I think because of the way I grew up, I, I've always wanted to to work hard yeah you know and to really love what I do I think that's another great example that my dad set for me yeah you know um, like you'll never work a day in your life if you love what you do kind sure. of mentality right so whether it was sports or news I think what I've kind of come to terms with is just the idea that I want to have a long career and that I want to have depth and breadth to what I do so I think of it as I never left sports in the first place. Yeah. I just became a better storyteller. I became a better reporter with my time in mm -hmm. news. I diversified my skill set. And yeah. now that I'm back into sports, like, I hope I haven't left news completely either. <laughs> right. You know, I want to do it all. You know, don't fault me for it. Yeah. I have an ex-boyfriend who 
kind of, you know, joked with me lovingly, like, oh, you want it all. I'm like, yeah, I do. Yeah, well, Let's try me. Like, yeah, you know? dream big. Like, that's the <laughs> yeah. thing is like, what's funny for me, and I'm not at, you know, the level where you and some others are, but I made it to where I wanted to go. I wanted to work, cover NFL teams, be on the sideline. And I got to do that. And when I talk to kids from high school, they're like, you were the weird kid that showed up <laughs> with a camcorder to our football games, like did broadcast. I did it in seventh grade. I showed up with a little camcorder, one of those 12 inch TVs with a VCR, which most people watching probably don't know what a VCR is, <laughs> but it recorded the video and I did play by play with a microphone. So like, that's how passionate I knew. I love that so much. Yeah. Kind of the same age as you did. That's what I wanted to do. Now with your career getting in sports, what was your first like kind of big break where you realized, all right, like, I'm good at this and I have a shot to make it my career. Uh, the very first game I worked on the sidelines for CBS College Sports Network. Mm -hmm. So it was 2010. At that point, I'd been um, out of college for three years and I was working at CBS News as Bob Schieffer's personal assistant. Mm -hmm. We'd been through the, the 2008 presidential campaign which was an incredible front seat to history that yeah. I front row seat to history that I had there and then I started doing some work um for cbsnews.com it's crazy to think that in like 2009 <laughs> they were just building out their online web, yeah. platform right like it was a big deal anyway I started doing some one-man band stuff for um for cbsnews.com and anyway it led to an opportunity for me with CBS College Sports Network they offered me two Navy home football games just to like try it out. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Working on the sidelines is something where until you've done it, you don't know if you're any good at it. Right. Like there's it's a no totally different ball game. It's a to totally unique experience. So um, I had these two Navy home games contracted and I just knew you know, there were a couple weeks into the season, mm -hmm. right? So there was one Navy home game prior to my first one where I knew I could go and meet the crew and kind of like get toured around right. and, and get the lay of the land. And I'm a kid who grew up like on the field for most LSU football games because my mom worked for the Athletic Foundation. Right. So I was just lucky yes. in that way. But um, so I knew, you know, knew my way around to an extent, but was mm -hmm. like, let me, let me get the tour. Let me meet everybody, get the lay of the land. Then there was an LSU Tennessee game that ended up being like legendary, uh, down to the final play. Uh, Tennessee won at the very end. Derek yeah. Dooley coached Tennessee, and anyway, I went and shadowed Sam Ryan, who was a uh, sideline reporter for CBS at the time, mm -hmm. and really got to see That's a hell of a her game in action. Do. It was incredible. They put time I learned, back on the clock. Yes, yes. it okay, was crazy. I remember it was, yeah. screaming. It was yeah. insane. But it was an incredible game for me in terms of learning experiences. Right. So the following week. There was a TCU Wyoming football game that was on CBS College Sports Network. And I saw on the schedule they didn't have a sideline reporter assigned to it. And it was a week before my first game at Navy. Mm -hmm. Anyway, my boss, Bob Schieffer, was a um, huge TCU football fan. So I went to Bob and I was like, hey, Good. would you want to go to the game? And he was like, well, yeah. I call up CBS College Sports. I'm like, hey, could I kind of shadow again? But I, you know, I... I'm going to be down there. Like just yeah, yeah. white lies. Here's, here's, you know, the jig is up now. We've all CBS. done that in this business where yeah. we're just like, like yeah, I'm we'll be there. Be there so right? is there any way I could? And they're like, I was like, I know you don't have a sideline reporter assigned, you know, kind of like, and they're like, well, yeah, well, why don't you just, do you want to just like get to work? <laughs> and I was like, you're kidding me. Anyway, so here's the <laughs> long story. Uh, I should be, uh, you know, when you give me time, I'll tell you a long story. Yeah. You know, on Thursday night football, you'll hear me for about yeah, 20 I mean, seconds of pop. You got 30 minutes uh, till this meeting, the, the, so we'll keep yeah, it rolling. Right. <laughs> so um, anyway, I, I knew TCU's head football coach, Gary Patterson, at yeah. the time. And I actually hear from Gary Patterson's wife that she'd been on Twitter and seen that because she's paying attention. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she had heard that Wyoming's quarterback wasn't even making the trip. There were rumors that he was hurt. We were questioning would he play. And like she breaks the story to us that he hasn't awesome. made the trip. So anyway, all that to say, that becomes my very first open. Um, which That's a is hell of an open. In, in my very first game. And it was the epitome of just sort of like reporting, you mm -hmm. know, like talking to everybody involved and see, not knowing when you pull this yarn where it leads you, but right. following the most interesting storylines of the game and just talking to anybody who might know something. Sure. And lo and behold, it was Coach Patterson's wife who uh, who gave me a big, big break in the info because Wyoming wasn't telling us. Right. Um, yeah. So that it really my first game. God, I'm really I appreciate That's that crazy. you took me back to that because it, um, you know, I'm not I'm not afraid to admit that 
there's a different level of pressure on me at this stage of my career. Yeah. Um, it's incredible to be a part of the Thursday night crew. Um, but you know, I haven't been on the sidelines in five years. <laughs> Like it's been a minute. Um, so it's been an interesting, you know, week by week process for mm -hmm. me talking about mental health, right? Yeah. Like, um, in reminding myself, you know, that I can do this and that I know how to do this yeah. and like building my confidence in this sphere back up, um, considering I've never covered the NFL before. Sure. So thinking back to that game, I really appreciate going yeah. back there because, um, at the end of the day, I think so much about this job is instinctual mm -hmm. and, uh, when you remind yourself that you have the the right instincts, you know, yeah. just sort of let the rest take care of itself. Because I'm a big, you know, preparation breeds confidence kind of person. Right. Um, but in the NFL right now, I again, not afraid to admit, there's a lot coming at me. Oh, and yeah. And I feel like I already can't wait until season two of, of this Thursday Night Crew together. Yeah. Uh, because that means a whole year under my belt of right. being in this league, being Experience, in this world, learning. building the relationships, getting to know the people and the right. faces. Because growing up in Baton Rouge... <laughs> I wasn't a huge NFL yeah. fan. I mean, the Saints are down the road, and Louisiana you know? loves the Saints, but LSU yeah. is king down there. Exactly. Is... So I've always been kind of a college uh, sports first person mm -hmm. as, as opposed to the pros. Uh, so I've just I've put a lot of pressure on myself in this job to to do the work and to do the homework and to to familiarize myself in that way that I'm yeah. giving myself confidence. But it's good to remind myself that I have the instincts that will I think you've done a hell of a job. I've always been a fan watching. I should have – pulled Thank up you. my phone before there's a photo i have of you interviewing coach o in like his interim year where he's like looking down giving some grin it was meme worthy i'll show you this after but my point being i know exactly what photo you're talking yeah, about. yeah it was me that took it so <gasps> really yeah <laughs> i know, exactly I know. What i'm gonna have to you're talking i'll about. put it up on the screen here but i'm glad you know exactly what I it do. was I because do. he's like just got like a gatorade bath and he, you're asking him a question he's just staring down like yeah Gosh, it was you. it was that was a fun moment in LSU history to be a part of, right? Like yeah. all the excitement he brought with him, one team, one heartbeat, you know, go all Tigers. Of, go, go Tigers. <laughs> um, all of that was, was super cool. Um, and it, it, I mean, if you ask me, you know, my favorite games to have ever worked and yeah. covered in when I was at ESPN, I'm going back to Tiger stadium, you know, I'm going back to, um, LSU baseball games at Alex box. Like I'm, I'm the box. It's it's, I didn't see, I came from up here where you have the reds, the oldest franchise mm -hmm. in baseball. There'll be 300,000 people that show up for opening day, giant parade. It's crazy. The college version of that yeah. is LSU. And it, it was super cool to be down there and get that experience back to your career, watching you grow from there to see you leave for CNN, then ABC back to Thursday night football. I'm curious, and on the mental health side of thing, I know there's a lot of young aspiring journalists, especially women, that want to be able to peel back the curtain. How tough is it and how unique is it to be a woman in sports journalism and working your way up? Because I see it, you know, as a teammate or coworker, and some of the things that, that happen in this business are wild. I mean, if, if you're going to be just completely blunt about mm -hmm. it, and it's got, you have to be really, really strong to make it through, especially as a woman mm -hmm. in sports. Yeah. And so I commend you for that. One, two, you do a great job, like I said, Thank but I'm you. curious for younger women that are watching that want to get into it, take me through that journey and some of those ups and downs. I've never thought of myself as a woman in sports. Yeah. I've just thought of myself as a sports reporter, if I'm being totally honest. Um, and I think I've been very lucky, and I don't discount this. I think I've been very lucky that I have worked with incredible men who have really supported me mm -hmm. and championed me um, and who've believed in me and trusted me. Um, but also, you know, it kind of goes back to that preparation breeds confidence thing. Right. I have always showed up to the best of my ability, as prepared as I can be, tried to ask the most thoughtful questions I can, tried to prove myself, you yeah. know, with every opportunity. Um, and I've been very intentional about that. And, um, and I think it's, it's, it's helped me to earn that right. respect. Well, and it that, it and shouldn't be a table. thing, yeah. man or woman, whoever yeah. you are, whatever you are working in this business. But, you know, I just see it when certain people get treated a certain way. It's like, yeah. so if you work your ass off to get somewhere and you're doing a great Dude, job, then hard. it shouldn't matter who you are. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, it's, if anything, I think I've tried to 
minimize the fact that I'm a woman in sports. Yeah. You know what I mean? Whether it's what, like... Well, hopefully me asking that wasn't no, 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 like in no, a weird not at all. spot. Not yeah. at all. No, no, no. People ask the question all the time. Um, and it's a completely reasonable question. But, you know, even when it comes to like what I'm wearing on the sidelines, you know, I try to be very conscious to not attract attention yeah. to myself, you know, just to sort of blend in as much as I can, mm-hmm. you know, when I'm not a 200-pound football player. Um, 200, you know, 280-pound football player, right? Right. With but, lights um, and a camera and a yeah, microphone. Yeah, exactly. And exactly. 70,000 people looking at you. <laughs> But, um, you know, I'm just sort of trying to blend in in a way that uh, makes it about the work. I've always just tried to make it about the work. And it it really hasn't been any more complicated than that. But again, I have to give credit to so many incredible men. And the crew I'm with now is the epitome of that. Mm -hmm. Um, Kirk Herbstreet has been wonderful to me since the very first time I met him when I was at ESPN in 2012. Yeah. You know, um, and now getting to know Al Michaels is just a dream. And Fred Godelli, our producer, it just... Um, it helps when the men you work with sure. do respect the work you do. I was going to ask because I grew up watching Al Michaels. He's a absolute legend. Mm-hmm. So do you pinch yourself when you're in those production meetings? Yes. Or like you're showing up to the stadium today to go to walk through? A hundred percent. Every <laughs> time. Every time. It is um, so cool. <laughs> it's just even when I get to hear Al say my name on TV, yeah. you know, it's, um, I'm still not used to it. Still not used to it. Last week in our, um, open from Cleveland, there was like, I don't know, some kid Cuddy song and he was, oh, no. from kid Cuddy to Kaylee Hartung <laughs> and y'all. There was a graphic that was coming over my face for the first couple of seconds, which was probably a better thing because right. I cracked like I just the biggest smile couldn't help but laugh I'm like is this real life yeah is this <laughs> from Kid Cudi to Kaylee Hartung in Al Michaels voice are you kidding me but no um Al's a legend he is it, like sometimes that word can be hyperbole and yeah. thrown he's the definition no. he's the voice of multiple generations of sports right. fans and I just feel so lucky and it's like it's it's lucky to for me to, it feels like just to get to learn from him. Sure. You know, like we're in our production meeting just now with Zach Taylor and, and to hear the questions he asks, the things that he's curious about, mm-hmm. and then to know that I'm hearing what Zach tells us or Mike McDaniel for that matter, um, or Tua or Joe, and then to hear how Al delivers it on a broadcast. Right. Like it, it's a fa- I'm a process person yeah. and it's just really cool getting you kind of get to study it mm-hmm. I mean you oh, don't kind of do. do you do you do you do and that's how I treated my job with Bob Schieffer in news that's how I'm treating my job with Alec you have to be a sponge I mm-hmm. think in these roles now obviously I'm not trying to be the next Al Michaels but he is a storyteller you know right. and that is a skill that I think no matter your role in this world like you have who doesn't want to be a good storyteller right. whether you're sitting at dinner with your friends or on prime video mm-hmm. Uh, with millions of people watching because the ratings are nuts. Um, But it's, um, yeah, I'm just trying to be a, trying to be a sponge, trying to be a student, whether it's him or Kirk for that matter. Right. Um, Yeah. You can tell that you love your job and thoroughly enjoy it, which comes across on air, but then even having a conversation like this, which is super cool because that's what you want. You want to grow up, live the dream, do exactly what you had wanted to do your entire life. You're doing that now on the biggest of stages. And so I'll ask this, uh, favorite person you've interviewed or done a story oh, with favorite. That's so tough. Cause I know, it comes in like different buckets in my career. Um, I'm take a dip in each. I mean, there's... yeah. Right. Let's see. Most recently, this is, I got to go like good morning America. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed a conversation I had with uh, Matt Damon about this new book he's just put out. It's called The Worth of Water. He has been on a quest um, in the last decade or so um, to bring, you know, drinkable water to parts of the world that don't have it. Like the statistics will blow your mind how Mm -hmm. much we take it for granted. Clean water. Um, and so seeing the the incredible work that he's done and and bringing awareness mm-hmm. to a struggle that so many people face that we can't it's a story with a purpose. wrap our mind around oh my gosh and he was just he was so passionate talking about it and he was just a lovely person the conversation felt so comfortable when mm-hmm. like let me tell you going into a conversation with Matt Damon guess who's a little nervous yeah you know um, but he, but he was he was really wonderful uh, similarly. 
Katy Perry. Um, I got to be with her the night before she opened her Vegas residency oh, back in December. Sweet. And the cool thing about it is, you know, PR people, right? Like no fault, love you, love all of you who I have to deal with. Yeah. But, um, you know, so often their job is to be that gatekeeper. You it's know, a layer to get to through. Keep, and... keep the ship running on time, but like, yeah, to be a layer, to be protective and whatever. And so I'm sitting there with Katie and we knew we were going to get to go behind, you know, we were sitting in like the auditorium yeah. at um, whatever hotel that is. I should remember resort world. Um, so you can see the stage behind us. Mm -hmm. And we knew that we were going to go backstage for her to show us around a little bit. And like mid-interview, Katie's like, let's go. And I'm looking at the camera guys. I'm like, <laughs> get your cameras and let's go. You know, and then we're back there and the PR lady, bless her heart, is like, okay, Katie, well, let's, let's, let's do move this on. And, let's do that. and Katie's like, I want to show Kaylee the giant bathtub. Kaylee, do you want to get in the bathtub with me? <laughs> And I was like, yes, Katie, let's get in the bathtub. Um, situations <laughs> you never imagine you find yourself in. Right. But the point of this story is that Katy Perry, who was one of the biggest superstars in music, yeah. right? Like of our, again, of our generation, right. of our lifetime, was so proud to show off this show that she had built and conceptualized right. during the pandemic. And she was, the, the energy from her and that sort of like what you were just saying, which mm -hmm. I take as a huge compliment, like the love for what she does was like, right just oozing out of her and I felt so lucky that I got to be somebody to get that tour and mm -hmm. to feel that passion from her yeah um in a way that that obviously is unique so those are two those are two fun ones but if we're talking sports yeah I was gonna say let's get one sports yeah. and all of those are super cool and one thing I'll note and you've met more famous people than I do but when they're genuine it makes it so much better on both sides yeah like oh my gosh and most people in this business are genuine but you'll have some that are the, you know, the asshole. Yeah. But, it was my, people always ask me like, Oh, who's, who's the, the biggest, biggest jerk? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's actually, I think surprisingly in a way I'm grateful for really hard for me to come up with an yeah. answer. There's a couple that I have in my head. Not yeah. Gonna say we it, don't need to like, go there. Yeah. I've been lucky. I think people have been, um, more, you know, kinder to me than, uh, than not. Thankfully, yeah. thankfully, thankfully. Um, gosh, so far to this point in sports. Oh gosh. I'm like having to like dig through the archives. I mean, if I, the truth is like, I love greatness. You yeah. know, I love being around greatness, proximity to greatness. Right. How cool is that? So, I mean, in my time at ESPN, I got a kick out of every interview I did with Nick Saban because it was always a challenge to me to, to ask it. a question that I thought he would respect, you know? Right. Um, and to get something out of him that made people want to listen, you right. know? Um, because when that man wants to be thoughtful, he is incredibly thoughtful mm -hmm. and it is truly like insight into one of the greatest of all time. Yeah. Um, so I always enjoyed those interviews. It's somewhat better than others. Even as an LSU fan. Um, even as an LSU, <laughs> but I was an LSU fan during the Nick Saban days, you know? Yeah. Um, so no, my appreciation for him is, is absolutely tremendous. Um, yeah. And in the NFL, you know, let's, Get, get back to me at the end of the season yeah, when I've got a full, you know, compliment. I will say I'm having a really great time now reconnecting with guys who I covered when they were in college. That's one of the coolest things about this it's job. One of the coolest things it truly is when you get to meet that guy when he's 18, 19 yeah. and, and, uh, you know, and has a dream and then here they are, you know, playing for a Super Bowl or, you know, um, or even just a starting quarterback in the NFL, right. you know, like Dak Prescott is one of those guys for me who I knew from before he was even a starter at Mississippi state. Yeah. And, um, Derek Henry, mm -hmm. another guy. And I just feel really fortunate, um, that I've gotten to see the, the progression yeah. their careers have taken and, um, be excited for them right. and, and watch them grow and mature. Well, that's one of the cool things for me is covering LSU. There's so many athletes in every sport. Yeah, we have all so over like, the place. Like Clyde Edwards Alary, for example, covered him his senior year at Catholic High. Oh and my then gosh. his freshman year at LSU and then see him at the AFC championship game last year against the Bengals. Mm -hmm. It's just crazy things like that. There's LSU baseball players that are coming up now that are in the big leagues. I just think the and now we're gonna do a little bit of homer stuff. But I mean like LSU, that that experience, Tiger Stadium and that those sports are second to none. And growing up in that, Fact. that, that had to be just one of the coolest things. I mean, I can say uh, as objectively as I possibly can, given that I'm born and raised in Baton Rouge, that it's as good as it gets yeah. down there. And I, because I can say that now because I've been You've everywhere been, right. in college sports and it's special. It truly is special. I think someone experiencing a game in Death Valley is a, a true cultural experience mm -hmm. when you go down there for the first time. I don't care where in the world you're from. I actually have some friends um, who are from New Zealand, but live in Denver who are coming to an LSU football game with me this fall. Let's go. And game? my level of excitement is through the roof. Yeah. Just for them to experience it's that. It's totally different. They have no concept at all of what that's going to be like, and I can't wait. 
So I'll ask this because, well, I don't know if you'll answer it on camera, but we'll see. We'll go back to college. Because mm-hmm. um, I had Jake Fraley on who plays at LSU, who plays for the Reds now. Mm-hmm. And I asked the same question, so I feel like I have to ask you. Favorite Tigerland bar? Oh, well, you know, I didn't go to LSU. What, but you but, had yeah, to go oh, out oh, when oh, you I came went, back. Because you went to Virginia, right? <laughs> I went to Washington and Lee in Virginia. Okay. Okay, well, in my day... It was bogeys. Okay, yes, that's the right answer. I'm a I'm a bogeys guy. Oh, yeah. When I moved, I unknowingly I moved there right after the flood, like a week after. Oh gosh. And had no idea that that had just happened. Well, I did because I worked in news. But I didn't know how bad it was. Yeah. And the only places to live were like student housing. So I move mm-hmm. in as a young journalist with like two kids from LSU, oh, right across the street from Bogies, and then uh-huh. became friends with the guys that run Bogies. Yeah, and those are my guys. That is um, such now. A fun I mean, place. my brother. You know, long after I was going to college bars. The only bar I would go to was Mike's okay. uh, to see my brother, who yeah. was a bartender there. Um, but yeah, it's been a while. Have you ever been asked about Tigerland bars in an interview? No, but I appreciate that <laughs> I just was for the very first time. Well, I appreciate that I was. Last yeah, I've been to them all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. It's, well, and I was talking to the, the Reds player, Jake Fraley, about it. And he's like, yeah, he went to jails. And I go, they had wine night, didn't they? He goes, yeah. I'm like, God, I should not know this stuff, mm-hmm. but... When you're young in the business, you have nothing else but like your coworkers to go out with totally. and have a good time. And yeah. You work in small towns. Um, last thing I'll ask you, you got to run getting ready for this game. Advice to a young journalist wanting to get into this right now. Um, the advice is do the work, be yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, this job is a lot harder if you try to be someone else. Sure. Um, just try to be the best version of yourself as you do the work and like, take risks when it comes to the opportunities that you're given. That's been the story of my career. I never could have charted the path that led me here. Mm -hmm. I never expected to be a reporter on the sidelines of an NFL primetime game. But now that I'm here, I'm like, how cool is this? Um, But I never could have charted the path. So I'm all for goals. I'm all for dreams, as we've talked about. But um, be willing to take risks and bet on yourself. Yep. No, that's... Some of the best advice. Kaylee, I appreciate it so much. I appreciate you, Brandon. Good luck on the sidelines this year, and we'll see everyone back here on the mental game next week. And a big thanks to Kaylee for opening up with me. We actually taped that episode back in the beginning of the NFL season when she was in town for the Jaguars Bengals game on Thursday night football. So big thanks to her again. And obviously, she's one of the best in the business if you watch her every Thursday night on Thursday Night Football. Coming up next week, right back here on The Mental Game, we have rapper Cal Scrooby joining me for another incredible conversation. Cal opening up about his music career, the ups and downs in the business out in LA. Also, he talks about his own battle with mental health. You've heard it in some of his songs. All of that and much, much more coming up next week, right back here on The Mental Game. (laughs) 